Welcome to our recording for Good Friday. Uh, I'm recording uh, the sermon from this evening uh, for those who can't make it to our drive-in. Uh, so let's just begin, begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for uh, this Good Friday. Thank you, Lord, for what it means for us that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose again on the third day and that we have life through him. Lord, as we think about that first Good Friday now, in these few moments, Lord, speak into our hearts and our lives and help us to understand that we may apply your word to our living, that we may know more of Jesus in our daily lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me begin uh, by reading a portion of the scripture that we're looking at today. Um, we're looking at John 19. So do pause the recording, read the chapter, and then uh, return. I'm going to read um, <clears throat> for now um, from verse 16. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the Place of the Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests, uh, of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather that this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers uh, had Jesus crucified. They took his garments and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots to see who shall, whose it shall be. This was to fill the scripture which says, they divided his garments among them, and for his clothing, clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus was his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and his disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, uh, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Think about life, because the reality is, human life can be a struggle. Sometimes a struggle with the people around us, uh, with family or with colleagues. Sometimes it is a struggle uh, within us. Of course, that's a problem that Paul himself highlighted in Romans 7, where he says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I, I have a desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want. But the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is, not, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in, within me. <clears throat> and so we see at the root of the struggle uh, in humanity is sin. And we underestimate the power of sin in our lives to our cost. We see something of the full strength of the struggle of man with the Lord in the gospel narrative. You see it uh, from 
Good Friday through the Easter Sunday. And what we see isn't pretty. Um, and yet in the midst of all that, through others, uh, we see ourselves. Yet the greater truth remains. That is, we know that in Jesus, we have power over sin. Because he alone dealt with our sin. He alone defeated death and has given us life from God that is eternal. More than that, a life given by God in his son dying in our place that satisfies him completely, that satisfies us completely as we trust in our Saviour. The struggle of life can only be solved through faith at the foot of the cross. So as we look at this passage from John 19, there are three things that we need to consider. Firstly, uh, the problem of Jesus. And you see it in verse 1 to 16. When we think about our struggles, nothing is stronger in life than the struggle for power. And that's precisely what you see going on here in John. What we see is the, the power struggle between the Jewish leaders um, and the Roman governor. Who will have control? Who will win by imposing their will on the other? Pilate is trapped in a sense by his desire for power, by the answer that the Jews give him in verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. We need to remember something really important here in chapter 19 because Pilate has already found Jesus innocent in chapter 18. However, what is overriding that is the political situation of Judea. Judea had a reputation in the Roman world for being a difficult province. And Pilate, as the governor of that province, was charged with keeping the peace. He should release Jesus without any further ado. But in an attempt to at least keep the Jews happy and quiet, Pilate has him beaten, with the intention of releasing him after he has punished him. Therefore it says in uh, verse 2 and 3 of chapter 19, the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed in him a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. We see the soldiers having their fun in beating Jesus, putting the crown of thorns on his head, bowing the knee to him as the supposed King of the Jews in their thoughts. They mock him and they taunt him in the midst of everything else. The charge that the Jews brought against Jesus was significant. Their hope had been that Pilate would interpret it from a political angle, so that Jesus in that sense would be viewed as a threat to Caesar, a rebel deserving death on a cross. Instead, the reality is just mockery from the mouths of the soldiers. However, for the soldiers, little do they know that as they bow the knee mocking Jesus, that he really is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Pilate's assessment is therefore that Jesus is no threat uh, compared to the might of Rome. Uh, he is critical of the Jewish religious leaders for suggesting that he actually might be a threat. And so presenting the beaten Jesus before them, Pilate attempts to show his his perceived weakness, that is Jesus' weakness. This man cannot be a threat to me or Caesar. Look at what I've done to him. Now surely I should release him rather than crucify him. But with the hatred of the Pharisees, it is a ploy that was destined to fail. They're not satisfied at all. The problem for them is that actually Jesus is a threat to them and to their position. Therefore they're insistent. And so they 
they cry, crucify him. And so we see the battle going on between them to assert power over the other. Therefore, since the political route is failing, the Pharisees at this stage change tack. You see, Pilate was not only charged with keeping peace as governor, he also has to uphold local law. And you see it in verse 7. We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. And at that stage, we're told that Pilate was afraid. Surely it is not that he is afraid of these men. No. The truth is, as a Roman, he believed in divine men. And therefore, the suggestion that Jesus just might be one such man, a man that he has just beaten, that terrifies him. That fear is amplified by the silence of Jesus under further questioning. And Pilate explodes. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Yes, he does. But only because he'd given it under the sovereign will of God. The Romans wouldn't have recognised that fact. That the sovereign Lord was in control here in Jesus' life and indeed in their lives too. But it was true nonetheless. It's not something that's exclusive to the Roman people either. Because you see it in the people from every generation. That they have lived their lives with the thought that they have full control over their lives. We see it today as well, don't we? A people who think that they have power and authority in the decisions of everyday life. Of course, whilst that might be true to a degree, the greater truth is that like Pilate, we all have to answer to the Sovereign Lord one day. And in particular to how we've responded to Jesus, the Son of God. The Jews rejected him as their king. Pilate treated him with contempt, even though he knew he was innocent of any crime. The question is, how have you, how are you living under the sovereign rule of God? Does he have his rightful place in your life? Or like the Jewish religious leaders in Pilate, have you rejected God's rule and therefore treat his son with contempt in your unbelief? Well, secondly, we see the cross of the king. Verse 16b onwards, Pilate's ins inscription on the cross read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The arguing continues, therefore, because the Jews reject the title in the same way that they reject the person of Jesus. Remember verse 15, Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. In choosing Caesar in this way, they not only rejected Jesus, they are actually rejecting God as well. In saying we have no king but Caesar, it puts Caesar in God's place in Israel. Historically, we know in Israel, as a nation, God is king. It is a kingship, however, that equally we know was delegated to an earthly representative uh, after Israel in 1 Samuel asked for a king like the other nations. Therefore, following on from this, in reality, the rejection of Jesus not only rejects God, it equally rejects the messi messianic hope. Why? Because the Messiah was part of the promise to David, God's king, God's earthly representative, saying that he would have a descendant on the throne forever. If Caesar is sitting on David's place, on David's throne, the promise to David is of no consequence anymore. Therefore, the response of those at the cross is clear. And it explains John's prologue at the beginning of his gospel, Chapter 1 verse 11, he, his, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. They are blind, blind with unbelief as John explains in chapter 12, because their hearts are hardened. They do not recognise their Messiah, their King and their Saviour, despite 
all the evidence of the gospel. A gospel that is written, as John explains to us in chapter 20 and verse 31, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Around the cross there were the soldiers who continued their cruelty and their mockery as they sit and divide up Jesus' clothes, as the spoils of their work, a benefit in kind if you like. With the robe we see scripture fulfilled from Psalm 22. They divide my garments among them and my clothing they cast lots. The tunic was not of any great value but the point is they try to humiliate Jesus, the Son of God, by taking not only his life, but also the clothes he wore. Well, as we think about the cross, we've seen the rejection and the mockery, but equally, let us not forget, there is the care and love of Jesus' great provision at the cross. And so we see the final point. It is finished. Jesus was faithful to the last. Verse 30, when he had received sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished is remarkable and profound as a dying statement because they are Jesus' last words. Leonardo da Vinci, uh, inventor and painter, was supposed to have said as his final words, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality that it should have. Last words are something that fascinate people today. And Da Vinci summed it up perfectly, the reality of human life, never reaching the standard it should, never able to please God. Whilst that's true for Da Vinci, it was not true for Jesus. It is finished are apt words because it says the work of Jesus, the purpose for which he has been born, has been fulfilled. He glorified his father at the cross as he glorified himself. He paid the price for sin, the sin of the world, redeeming mankind by defeating death itself. He won life eternal for a people who are the people of God by faith. In all of this, the essential question for each of us on this Good Friday is, are you personally def depending on the finished work of Christ? If we're to know life to the full, if we're to know the life of God, if we're to know life when our earthly body dies, then the only thing that we can do is cling to the cross. Only there do we know forgiveness. Only there do we know a saviour. As Acts 4 and verse 12 clearly says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no, under, no other name under heaven given to men by which they must be saved. It is finished. Jesus died for you. And as Paul said to the Philippian jailer in Acts, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Therefore believe in who he is. He is your King, Saviour and Lord. Believe in what he did. He died for your sin. And therefore believe in the finished work of the cross of Christ. Effective for you. Now. Effective once and for all. That we might know life that is eternal. In the grace and the love of God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father thank you uh, for the cross. Thank you Lord for Jesus. Thank you for his blood poured out for us, his body broken, that our sin may be forgiven. He is our perfect sacrifice. Thank you for him. Lord, fill our hearts and our lives with the hope that Jesus alone can give. Fill our lives with hope because of that first Good Friday and help us to live for Jesus each and every day that in us he may have all the glory and all the honour, that we may point a people to their need of salvation in how we live and all that we proclaim. 
Help us to proclaim the gospel. Help us to proclaim Jesus, that the world may turn to him and be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.